Who would like to hear me being a socialist? Raise your hand. <laughs> the other choice is redistribution, stuff about redistribution. Okay, I'll, I'll do the socialist stuff and then I'll come back to this if I have extra time. Um, okay. Okay, so um, you guys probably learned the first welfare theorems in your classes and you probably you know, took an interpretation or learned an interpretation of them that was really pro-market. So the first welfare theorem says that you know, anything uh, that occurs in the market must be Pareto-efficient, right? Um, the traditional interpretation is market is efficient, so sort of leave it alone. But this is not always how the first welfare theorem has been seen, and in fact, I don't think it's how it should be seen. So many uh, famous socialists argued something very different. They said that what the first welfare theorem says is that the allocation implemented by the market is exactly the same as the allocation implemented by a social planner. And therefore, that there's nothing that the market can accomplish that a social planner can't accomplish. And then in fact, we know that in reality there's externalities and uh, market power and so forth, so a social planner must be more efficient than the market, right? And um, therefore, uh, and in fact, we'll study these sorts of things throughout the course. So they said socialism actually must be more efficient than the market. It actually implements a true market. And think back over Eric Budish's example. That was a case where everyone was submitting these preferences to some centralized thing. There wasn't any decentralized market going on. And that was supposed to implement the efficient thing. And so what these socialists said for many years is that, uh, you know, all that the welfare theorems are saying is that stupid deviations that aren't efficient planning shouldn't, you know, aren't good things. But no, no smart planner would do that either. And therefore, the welfare theorems are just as much in favor of socialism as they are in favor of capitalism. Um, and um, therefore, uh, Friedrich Hayek um, argued, well, and in fact, Ludwig von Mises before him, that it's not the welfare theorems that are the reason we want capitalism. In fact, the welfare theorems have nothing at all to say about whether socialism or capitalism is more desirable. Instead, um, the problem is that a planner, in order to make these decisions about an economy, needs to have information about what's going on all over the economy, about what people's preferences are, about what the technology is, about how trans, you know, all this sort of stuff you need to get in one person's head. And the problem is, how would a planner get these things without prices? The classic example von Mises gave was, imagine that you're trying to build a railroad. You know, you could either build the railroad through a mountain, or you could go around the mountain, you could go over the mountain, or you could go through the mountain. Now, going around the mountain is going to require more steel for the railroad, but going through the mountain will require more man hours to dig the tunnel. How do you figure out which one of those is more valuable without knowing how to trade these things off, which is what prices tell you, right? Um, it requires some huge calculation to figure out what's going on in the rest of the economy to do that without prices. Whereas in a price system, all you need to know is the prices of all those different factors and you can make a trade off. Um, so this view says that the market is really an aggregator of information. It's not just you know, the efficient system that the benefit of the market over socialism is it allows all these decentralized calculations and all the private information of individuals to be incorporated into prices. Because individuals can make a profit off of you know, taking something that's cheap and selling it expensive, they have an incentive to incorporate the information they have about what's cheap and expensive into the prices in the market. Right? Another classic example of this is the idea that no one knows how to make a pencil. I don't know if anyone's ever read this essay, I Pencil, but it's about the fact that, you know, one person might know how to take the graphite and to cut it up into the cylinder so it can go into the pencil. And another person might know how to chop down the tree. And another person might know how to turn the tree into planks. And another person might take, take the planks and turn them into the, you know, thing that goes around the graphite. And someone else might put the two things together, but no one knows how to actually make the pencil on their own. So how could a central planner possibly hope to plan an economy when no one knows how to make something as simple as a pencil? 
OK. So um, if, if market failures are therefore the main cost associated with the market relative to a planned economy, the main benefit is delegation. Individuals have information that the government doesn't have, and the market gives them an incentive to incorporate those into prices, even if it has to give them market power and therefore cause distortions, even if it has to create externalities and therefore cause distortions. At least it incorporates this information held diffusely by people into the decisions made by society. So there's a lot of economic models that we'll actually study throughout this course that formalize exactly this idea. So I didn't get a chance to talk about redistribution yet, but a basic trade-off in redistribution is that if we could just charge everyone however much money they're going to end up making without actually knowing how much money they're going to end up making, we could redistribute all the wealth we wanted. But the problem is we usually don't know how much money people are going to make without actually seeing how much money they make. And when we charge them based on how much money they actually make, that discourages them from working hard. Right? So if we knew all this stuff, if the centralized system had all this information about people, we would be able to do lots of redistribution. And that might be more equitable, even more efficient in some ways, but we can't do that because people know their own abilities and the government doesn't. And so that lack of information forces us to allow people to amass large fortunes in order to give them an incentive to work. Um, Another question is, you know, when does regulation make sense? When should we regulate industries to avoid market power? Right? Well, we want to do that to keep down the prices, but it's hard when the regulator doesn't know what the costs of the firm are, because it could force the firm to shut down if it charges, if it forces them down to too low prices. And so if the regulator knew all, everything, we would have prices exactly at cost that would be much more efficient. But we don't necessarily know that. And therefore, we have to leave the economy less regulated, which is less efficient, but allows people to incorporate their private information into the allocation. We'll talk about my job market paper on patents versus prizes. You know, um, when uh, we'd like to incentivize people to do innovation, and we often give people intellectual property for that. But that's a very inefficient system, right? Because we'd much rather have them charge prices at cost and just give them prizes for the social value of their products so that we didn't have the distortion to the quantity produced of the goods, right? Uh, but that's really hard if the government doesn't know how valuable something is without seeing how much people are willing to buy it in the marketplace, right? So um, another example of this is how much information should we give to consumers? Should we give consumers all the detailed specifications of the product and let them sort out what they want to buy? Or should we have some centralized government agency that says this is a good product, this is a bad product? Um, like in the licensure example. Well, which one of those is going to be optimal depends on how much information the consumers have about what's good or bad for them personally versus how much uh, you know, information the central planner can get about the overall benefits and costs of the thing. So, so many areas of economics are about trade-offs between centralization and decentralization based on where the information lies. Um, and um, the existence of market distortions means that centralization is always going to be better absent the possession of private information by individuals. But the existence of private information by individuals will force us to rely on markets rather than centralization in some cases. So capitalism is therefore justified uh, really by a lack of computational power and by a lack of information, ability to aggregate information by a centralized planner. That's really the whole basis of capitalism if you believe the Hayekian argument. Um, now, I argue in a, in a piece that I'm working on right now that this whole way of justifying why markets exist and why they're valuable is really being challenged by the development of our economy in the information age. So Hayek wrote in a time where we had all of these um, goods that uh, were basically complements for private information. 
you had all these new machines and someone needed to know how to operate them. Someone needed to know how to put together the pencil. There was all this specialization and there was people with all this specialized knowledge and to make the industrial economy work, you needed to delegate to them all these decisions uh, and put up with all the inefficiencies that came from that to make things work. But if you think about the internet age, all the local knowledge that people have is gradually being superseded by the knowledge that exists in this conglomerate thing that we call the internet. And there's no necessary reason why that has to belong to any given individual. Right? So um, one example of this uh, is the fact that, I don't know if anyone uses, I don't know if Netflix exists here, if there's an equivalent, but you know, something like 50% of all movie purchases in the United, or rentals in the United States are now based on what some algorithm tells you you should want to watch. Not based on what people choose themselves. Now you would have said before, look, the Soviet system, maybe it's good at producing steel, maybe it's good at doing this other stuff, but at figuring out what consumers want, it's terrible. And yet, now we have a centralized algorithm that's telling people what their preferences are. And Google doesn't even ask you what your preferences are, it just watches what you do, and it figures out what you want to see. And that, I think, is increasingly eroding the case for capitalist institutions. Um, decision engines are increasingly making choices for us. Uh, it's increasingly easy for Apple to figure out which apps are good without actually seeing what you buy, but you can see what you spend time on, right? Um, it's increasingly easy to monitor people's income and even their ability, as we know genetics and how that's related to people's eventual success in life, right? Um, consumer decisions in financial markets are increasingly, I think, becoming uh, you know, really inefficient because we have the ability to com compute what is the optimal financial decisions for people to make in a very centralized way, much better than any individual can do. That didn't always used to be the case, but it's increasingly becoming the case with the computer power we have available. And that makes the case for centralization increasingly strong. So many of these changes have actually been managed by the market. So you know, Google and uh, Amazon and all these people are centralizing things without us even realizing it. But if you think about it, there's distortions introdu introduced by the fact that they have intellectual property, by the fact that they want to keep things secret, all the, and, and, and that's actually reducing the efficiency. So once things are so centralized into these things, it makes a lot of sense for them to be controlled by the state or to be heavily regulated by the state in a way that really fundamentally erodes the values of capitalism. Um, and so some, I think Danielle, uh, uh, asked me the other day whether capitalism would be its, un, its own undoing, whether Marx was in the end right, and I think that Marx was right for the wrong reasons in many ways, uh, but, but I think maybe in the end is right because the increasing proliferation of information technology is making the basic case for capitalism wrong, I think. So to give sort of another example of this, um, John Stuart Mill uh, famously wrote uh, about why we should give people liberty. And you know, if you look at the Declaration of Independence in the United States, people say we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created and equal and endowed with all this you know, right to liberty and so forth. So we usually just take liberty as a value in and of itself. And Mill said that doesn't make any sense. Really, the reason why we value liberty is the same reason why parents leave choices open to their children. It's not that they're forced to, and it's not that they're, uh, they agree with their children on what their children should be doing. In fact, they probably wish their children did other things, but what they think is that, look, I don't know everything about my child's life. I can't monitor them completely. So I'm gonna leave open to them choices so that uh, they can use their private information about their circumstances, which I don't have, uh, to make the best decisions, even if if I had their information, I would make a different decision in their place. Um, and that very much corresponds to what we do as children get older. As they learn more, as it becomes harder to monitor them, we give them more and more choices because we think that even though we have different preferences from them, we still want to leave choices available to them because they're increasingly becoming more knowledgeable about the consequences and their private information is becoming more important than the differences in our preferences, right? 
And um, this, I think, is true not only in terms of how we delegate to markets because of the standard externalities, but in terms of paternalism by the government towards people. You know, to the extent that there's private information that people hold, it makes sense to leave liberty open to them. And that's basically what Mill argued. That is, to the extent that people know what's best for them better than society knows, we should delegate to people. But to the extent that it's increasingly possible to understand all the things that are in people's mind through, you know, uh, through genetics, through uh, all the ways we can monitor their preferences and behaviors, through uh, neuroscience, all these sorts of things, the case for allowing liberty, uh, you know, scope for freedom is going to be increasingly eroded. I mean, it's increasingly going to make very little sense for us to just have people choosing things and much more sense for us to learn what they would have chosen and just do that for them anyway. And solve the distortions that come from the fact that our preferences differ from theirs. Um, okay. So, uh, throughout the course, we're going to be exploring exactly these types of trade-offs. And you'll see the many ways in which individuals and markets misbehave, but also how hard it is to get the relevant information to a centralized planner to solve it. And the optimal degree in, in, of intervention is always going to depend on this balance between trying to aggregate the information and uh, the values of the individuals. But these trade-offs, I would argue, and you can see if you believe it as we go through the course, are increasingly becoming uh, tilting towards centralized solutions because of the emergence of information technology. Um, and uh, the the key question that you always have to deal with are not qualitative things like the market is always better or the government is always better. They're going to be quantitative trade-offs about how much information lies in each place and how much distortions lie in each place. And that's, um, those detailed properties of markets are things that have to be studied empirically or thought through carefully at an intuitive level. Um, and the goal will be to beat out of you uh, what is very natural if you grow up in a westernized society, which is this notion that there's this conflict between you know, the good of the government and the good of the market. Um, instead, what we'll learn is that there's all sorts of trade-offs about centralization and decentralization that incur in markets as well as in governments. And that um, really the key question is quantitatively, how, where do these information lie and how should we organize things as a result? Um, I have five minutes that I could go back and talk about the second welfare theorem if you want, or I could just take questions, or we could start office hours earlier, whatever you guys want to do. I think we're going to do plenty of stuff on redistribution in the redistribution lecture, so I don't think it's that important that I, that I talk about this. So, um, what do you guys want to hear about matching markets for five minutes? Gabrielle, what do you want? about information all this yeah. is that it's not only information that yeah. has changed everything to say this yeah. uh, it's all to not it's all technology what what has changed because I think we have now like the ability to produce lots of things, lots of wealth of yeah. products at least but neither market or government or, or, or this are capable to, in this new context, uh, distribute uh, well everything. So I think that's the main problem. Well, I mean, I think that the, I mean, if you believe Hayek's analysis, which you don't have to, but, but I think it's, it captures a lot of important things, and I think it's the foundation of much of what we're going to talk about in the rest of the course. If you believe Hayek's analysis, the basic problem is that, um, you know, we need the, information in order to make those choices. And I think he lived at a time when we were inventing all these new machines. And they were physical machines that needed to be operated. You needed to know how to operate them. And there was all sorts of people dispersed all over the economy who were able to specialize in learning that. And during that period, it's almost certainly correct that decentralization was incredibly important. Because you needed to delegate to all these people 
the ability to get that specialized knowledge. That just isn't true anymore. We have this huge computational capacity that's capable of centralizing so many of these things that previously had to be decentralized. And in fact, there have been other periods in human history where centralization was clearly superior because information technology was ahead at that point in history of uh, the physical technology. So for example, you know, most of the development of civilization prior to the Greeks was, came through greater centralization because there wasn't very much complicated things. It was very easy to monitor what was going on. And the information technology was getting much better. There was writing and things like this, right? On the other hand, in the period of the Greeks, technology was starting to outstrip information technology. And so decentralization, democracy, the market economy of the Roman, that became much more important. And almost all societies shifted that direction. And that got even more and more extreme as we got towards the modern period. Right? Um, and that's why we had capitalism and so forth. But something fundamentally changed when information became the dimension of technology and that got far outstripped the uh, importance of the improvement of physical production technology. So I think we're living in a period where the natural logic of economic optimization is going to lead us towards centralization. And we have to decide if that's something we feel comfortable with or whether we think that there are things about human dignity, about the values we've come to have in society, which say that you know, we really shouldn't have so much centralization. But that's going to come from outside of standard economic models. It's going to come from more of the sorts of things that you read about in 1984 or Brave New World or things where you think about the fundamental value of human choice rather than the economic logic of, of optimization. So, Anyways, office hours now. So if you, anyone who wants to come can walk back with me. <laughs>